make sure that we capture all the goodness we're going to be chatting about today. Um, I'm going to sit mostly with my screen on the slide deck. I will have the chat box open in the background. So please, if you've got any questions, just load them into the chat box so we can make sure that we capture them all. Um, and we get through this in the next hour. So we're talking today about a website not being enough. Um, I want to chat to you particularly about something that I'm going through right now to provide a bit of context around why I'm so passionate on this topic at the moment. A little bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, as I mentioned, we're here for the next hour. Um, we will be, I will be capturing everything that goes on in the chat box. So just let me know. Uh, I see we've had a couple of other people join us. So just pop a little note in the chat box. Let me know where you're zooming in from. Um, maybe what type of business you've got too. So we can talk about different industries and different businesses as we go through the next hour. This webinar is brought to you by ASPAS, the Australian Small Business Advisory Service, the folks at Business Station in WA and the lovely people at RDA in Brisbane. So uh, thank you to everyone who has collaborated to make this happen. So we've got automotive workshop, motorsport and tuning preparation. Ooh, motorsport, do love a good, I'm an F1 fan, Andrea, so we might have to chat about that offline. All right, a little bit about uh, who I am and why I'm here presenting today's webinar. For those of you who don't know me, as I said, my name is Tracy Sheen. I'm known as the digital guide. I have 30 plus years, <clears throat> excuse me, in marketing and sales. I'm fighting a cold. So if I appear to be a little, um, you know, not quite with it, I'm blaming the cold. Uh, so I kicked off in this arena in 1990 and I've been working with small business marketing, sales and technology since then. I'm a recognized certified practicing marketer and that's been uh, acknowledged by excuse me, the Australian Marketing Institute, which is the governing body for marketers in Australia. I hosted the world's first panel style podcast called Not Another Business Show. So I'm considered a podcast pioneer in Australia. I now judge at the Australian Podcast Awards and have done since 2015. I judge the Australian Book Business Book Awards, although I won't be this year because I'll be entering my book. Uh, I judge the Australian Web Awards. I also judge the Australian Marketing Awards. So you can see I'm quite connected into the small business community around marketing and sales. I've been nominated as one of the top 10 small business leaders in Australia for 2021. And I recently released my book, The End of Technophobia, a practical guide for digitizing your business. So that's written for every small business owner that's ever gone. I don't know where to start. I'm overwhelmed. I don't understand, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I want to start with the stats around the online environment now. So there's no denying 2020 really shook things up in the way that not only we had to conduct business, but the way that our clients interacted with our brands and with our companies. So um, Australia posted a really big survey towards the back end of last year and recognized that 82% 80, of all Australians purchased something online last year. So just think about that from an 82%. Now I can even think about my mum and dad, they're mid eighties. They live in the North coast of New South Wales. I transitioned mum and dad to shopping online for their groceries. So, um, you know, help them get set up with Woolies. They get home delivery now. And, you know, that was something that they never had considered doing prior to COVID. They always used to like you know, popping over to the shops once a fortnight, wandering around, doing all of that kind of stuff. Now they just, you know, go out for their coffee, but they do a lot of their shopping and things online. So we just had to upgrade dad's iPad to allow him to do a few more things. So I love that more people um, became aware of how they could interact online as a result of the pandemic. In 2020, around 9 million households made a purchase online. 7.6 million are now considered to be regular online shoppers. So that means they purchase something 
you know, once a month, once every six weeks. So they're online, they're doing things on a regular basis. 1.36 million Aussie households made an online purchase for the first time in 2020. So imagine that leap in terms of stats and just think about the number of businesses that missed out because they weren't ready to capture what was going on during the pandemic. And another interesting one I found was that an average now 4.4 devices per adult were used to access the internet in 2020. So if you think about that, you know, in our house, um, I'm coming to you on my desktop at the moment, my laptop sitting in the lounge room. I've got my mobile sitting beside me. I've got my iPad beside my bed. We also have an Apple TV that has access to, you know, YouTube and smart devices and things like that. So we are having more and more devices just kind of piling up around it. So it's not just a laptop or a mobile. It's, you know, when we're now thinking already about this whole bigger online environment and what does that actually mean for us as suppliers and what does it mean for our consumers so initially you know already start to think about well what does that look like what does that look like if you're in a an automotive workshop how are your people interacting with you are they you know when they're on site for a race are they you know accessing things via the mobile are they checking stuff via the ipad how are they interacting with you so i want to share a little story with you um, and this will kind of give you some context of where we're going and why as i said i'm so passionate about this online environment thing versus just a website right now so we're in the market to buy a caravan We've never vanned before in our lives, um, but I'm starting to do some more workshops and heading out into regional areas. And I thought, hey, it'd be really nice if we had a caravan. I can take my couple of dogs. We can turn it into a couple of week trip and, you know, head out to Longreach, Kanamala, go to some cool places, see a bit of the countryside, but also get to meet and run workshops in person, right? Great idea. But We've never vanned before. So how do I, where do I even start? What did that look like? So my journey into becoming a caravanning person um, went to, ah, awesome, Andrew, we're definitely going to have to chat. You know, it started like this. So the first thing I did was jump on and download caravansales.com.au and car sales because we realized that we needed a different car other than our little Renault Megane to tow a van. So I started there. I then went to, um, you know, some of the, the van websites, Jayco, things like that, started to read about light vans. We figured out pretty early on that we only want a single axle because we don't want something too heavy. We've never towed before, you know, so we started looking at websites, reading blogs. I've jumped on YouTube. I've watched some videos for some people who do this kind of stuff they just travel around and do the big lap as I learned it was called and um, you know they sell the parts they they create content on YouTube around that I've been listening to some podcasts for some people who you know just travel around and live out of our caravans and work and do that kind of stuff uh, I've been reading blogs I've downloaded ebooks I've wandered through um, boating, camping, BCF and Anaconda. I've spoken to people. I've started connecting in Facebook groups. So you can see my point is it's not just one spot. I've not just gone to a website now and kind of gone, right, I'm starting and I'm ending here. I'm cherry picking from across the internet, looking to create a big picture to inform me before I go and make a purchase. I'm looking at reviews. I'm looking at people's Google My Business. I'm looking at Facebook pages. I'm involved in groups. I've been checking out Pinterest. I've discovered there's a whole thing around, you know, converting the inside of your caravan, making it pet friendly. So you get my point now, right? And this is what I'm talking about, whatever industry you're in, this is what your clients are doing now. They're not just jumping on your website, starting the conversation and ending it by checking out in your cart. So I want you to start thinking about as we go through, where does your stuff sit? How does it fit? And how are you meeting with your clients where they need to be? All right. So 
in my mind, as I've been kind of thinking this through, there's really seven steps that I want you to be considering um, to create and curate an online environment for your clients. We're going to go through them one by one. If you've got any questions, pop them into the chat box. You'll want to make sure that you get what you really need out of this 50 minutes that we've got left. So the first thing is speed. So I don't know about you, but if I jump on a website now and it takes longer than a couple of seconds to download, I'm out. I'm done. I'm going to look somewhere else. So it's really, really important when you're considering this online environment as to how quickly people can access your content. So people, me, and Google are looking for quick load times to your site. So that's not just your um, accessing your website from a desktop. It's what does it look like if I am out and about and I want to check, you know, your address, your opening hours, anything like that from your mobile, from my mobile. How quickly does that load? It's the first impression that people typically get, not just of your website, but perhaps of your brand. So if I'm sitting there and things are taking, you know, forever to load, that gives me a first impression that perhaps you're not as up to date with what's going on in the digital space. Perhaps you don't put as much care or effort into your site. So these are all assumptions. They may or may not be accurate, but these are all assumptions that your clients are making before they've even interacted with you, before they've even got to have a look at your about page or your services page. So typically we know that if your site takes longer than three seconds to load, around 40% of your visitors are going to abandon their search. So just think about that for a minute. If I type in the digitalguide.com.au, one, two, three, if it's not loaded by now, I'm out. I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to look for someone else that can assist me on my search. So the big takeaway from the first step around speed, do a regular speed test on your site and fix any errors that are coming up. Typically, we know the biggest errors in terms of speed are photos. So making sure that your photos are optimized for web um, and really making sure that they're compressed and they're not taking up a great deal of load time. So I use a site called GT Metrics. My SEO guy introduced me to it. So GT M-E-T-R-I-X. It's a free site. You can pop your URL in there and it will give you a bit of a rundown on how quickly your site loads um, and that'll give you a really good place to start. So step one, speed. Speed is really important in our online environment. Number two, mobile responsiveness. Should have fixed that text, shouldn't I? There we go. Mobile responsiveness. So we know now that people aren't just accessing your content, your brand from a laptop. As I said, we're out and about, we pick up the mobile, we're looking for something on the mobile, we're on our tablet, we're looking for something on a tablet. So it's really, really important that your site, that all of your content is just as reactive on a mobile device as it is on a desktop or a laptop. In fact, we know now that around 55% of a global internet usage is done through mobile devices. Now, this is really going to depend on your brand and your clients. My people, I know, for example, when they're searching for um, education, consulting, people that can speak, run workshops, et cetera, what I do, majority of my searching actually does come from a desktop or from a laptop. Um, but that's really rare these days that the majority of your people are looking via desktop or laptop. Far over, I see more people accessing content via a mobile device. So around 3.8 million Google searches are completed every minute. So you can imagine there's already been, you know, several million, I'm not great at, with maths, several million uh, searches have already been conducted since we started the webinar. And of those, around 60% of them are done via a mobile device. So, you know, just think about your own life when you're out and about. How many times are you picking up your phone and just doing a quick search for something? You know, you're sitting with a cafe at a cafe with some mates and something comes up. Who sang that? Who was in that movie? Have you been watching that thing? What do you do? You jump on Google, don't you? So think about how your content, how your brand, how is it represented 
on a mobile device as well as on a laptop or a desktop. The majority of local-based searches occur on a mobile device. So if you want to pop into the chat box, if you're a local-based business, so if you have a premises or somewhere where people come to see you, that is going to be far more important than a business like mine, which is based from you know, a, a, um, a virtual space. I can, I go to my clients and I operate from a virtual space. If you have a bricks and mortar premises or you're expecting people to come and see you, you really need to make sure that your mobile responsiveness is up to speed, back to speed. Okay, more people order goods. So e-commerce stuff from mobile devices than from laptops. So I got a new puppy who's asleep somewhere, I hope at the moment, or he's chewing through something. He's a little 10 week old at the moment. So still very, very young. So all of the stuff that I've been looking to entertain him with and do all that kind of stuff, I'm doing when I'm sitting in front of telly watching Lego Masters or something, and I'm Googling to, you know, pick him up a collar or pick him up a harness or register him into puppy preschool. I've done all of that through the mobile phone, not via my laptop smartphone usage makes up around 80 percent of social media browsing so again think of it yourself you know i'm sitting in front of lego masters i'm sitting in front of telly i'm scrolling through facebook i'm catching up on you know who's posted what through the day what's going on looking at my linkedin profile that kind of stuff it's rare that i'm doing those kinds of searches now on my laptop or my desktop and it's rare that your clients are Google will rank you for mobile responsiveness. Now they're looking, they have a policy in place called mobile first. So they want your content, they want your website, they want all of that kind of stuff um, to rank speed wise, look wise, the, the layout, how uh, interconnected everything is. They want that to be created for a mobile first and they will penalize your business they will penalize your url if it is not mobile responsiveness so if you're unsure about that google your business name drop a new url into google on your phone on your smartphone and just see how it looks you know if things are running off the page if it's not looking good then chances are Google are penalizing you for that. And you definitely want to get that looked at. Okay. So number one, we had speed. Number two, we've just talked about mobile responsiveness. Number three, let's look at security. Now, this is the first time we've kind of moved away just from kind of the stuff around the website. And now we're starting to think about protecting our clients in an online environment. So typically when I run workshops or when I talk to people about cybersecurity, the focus is all on the business. Understandably, right? There's a lot of stuff that we need to consider as business owners to protect our own data, our own staff, our own IP around, you know, phishing, ransomware attacks, all that kind of stuff. We need to be really, really savvy and know that, you know, we typically don't open an email if we don't know who it's from. We certainly don't click on links. We want to make sure that our staff are really, really savvy when it comes to those phishing expeditions. We're backing up, we're doing all of that kind of stuff. But more and more, and particularly I'm seeing this with, you know, clients that I'm working with in, say, Europe or the US, they're really savvy and they really want to know what our policies are around protecting their own data. So you think about what happened, when was it, a couple of years ago with the big Facebook breach um, and I've just forgotten the name of it now, it was there and then it's disappeared. Um, you know, where, where we found out that all of this data got released onto the internet and our emails were out there and, you know, our personal information. So we're becoming really hypersensitive to what we're sharing as consumers and knowing how our, bri our brands that we're interacting with are utilizing that data. How's my information stored if I purchase with you online? Um, if I'm in a monthly membership with you, how is that information stored? Who's getting that information? Do you share it with anyone? What does that look like? So starting to think through now, if you haven't done it, what's your policy? So if somebody says to you, or if you can put it on your website, 
what does this look like if? So if you were to breach be breached in terms of you know you have a phishing attack and someone gets in and downloads all your data or something happens that can impact the sentiment of how I feel as a client to interact with you I'm suddenly not feeling safe I'm wanting to know what you're going to do to protect my information my credit card details my personal information so interestingly according to IT learning around 41 percent of clients will not work with a business that's experienced a security breach Okay, so think about that for a second. We're all still working with Facebook. We know what happened there. We know what continues to happen there. But in terms of small businesses, in terms of, you know, medium-sized businesses, if I know that you've experienced some kind of hack, some kind of breach, then the chances of me working with you again become significantly slimmer. So just starting to think through what are those policies? What are those procedures? What are those things that we need to have in place that if someone says to me, hey, you know, I'm about to purchase with you online. I'm about to enter into a, you know, a reasonable agreement with you. What happens if, what does this look like? Where are you storing my data? All of that kind of stuff, what happens? So thinking about, do you have any industry requirements? Do you have any government? We all have government requirements that we need to meet, but do you have any specific industry requirements that you need to be getting ahead of that curve? I guarantee you 100% this is going to be a really, really, really big issue in the coming kind of 12 months to three years time. We're going to see security rise up and up and up and up and up the chain in terms of what our clients are looking for when they're dealing with us in an online environment particularly now we're seeing this increase in you know uh, regular regular consumption happening online okay so we had speed number one we had mobile responsiveness number two we've just talked about security the next thing I want to touch on is SEO now typically we think of SEO uh, around our website right so what keywords can we um, put into content that's going to help us reach page one that's going to help us reach more people but I want you to start thinking about a few things other than just the typical what we've come to know as SEO now, there's a real rise around voice search. So again, if you think about it, you know, as we're in the car on the weekend, um, we're based, I'm based in Toowoomba and Darling Downs. There was a great little festival about an hour from here, 45 minutes called the Hampton Food and Wine Festival. So we jumped in the car. I just said, you know, hey, Google, just waiting for my phone to answer, um, you know, direct me to blah, blah, blah. Now that's voice search, right? And that's becoming more and more common. So think about how you're reacting with your phone, how you're um, asking for advice, what you're looking for, because you can begin to optimize your content, not just a website, but think about podcasts, think about videos, think about um, LinkedIn, think about your social media, because Google is getting that smart now that it is starting to be able to index voice across the domains. So what we're beginning to see, it's rolled out in the States, it's rolled out in Canada, it's beginning to roll out in Australia. If you have content that you've optimized for voice, if I search for, you know, best automotive supplier, um, Brisbane, if, if um, Andrea's done some work around making sure those keywords are in there and we've done a little bit of work around the voice optimization, then there's more of a chance that my voice question is going to be filtered up by Andrea's um, offerings of what she's got on her website, on her LinkedIn, on her Google My Business, on this bigger kind of environment. So start thinking through how your people, and it might mean that you've got to start asking people, you know, hey, do you use voice search at all? You know, when you're in the car, do you, do you, how do you, you know, put your directions in? Do you use voice search? Do you still type it in? What are you doing? And start to get ahead of the curve in terms of that. And there's a lot of information around that out on the, the internet. So if you type in, if you want to know more about that, if you just Google optimizing for voice search, you'll find some answers around that. We can do a one-on-one -on -one talk a little bit more about it. Another thing around SEO now is this omni-channel shopping. So we're seeing this more and more. So ensuring that you've got a solution for a person who wants to just 
completely purchase online, who wants some kind of hybrid model. Maybe they want to come into the shop and then order when they're in the shop. Maybe they want to, you know, jump through a few hoops, um, pick stuff up, you know, have it delivered to a different location, et cetera. So again, think about what your business does, how it interacts with your clients and what their needs might be you know, start to think six months, 12 months down the track, have a look at how um, their buying patterns have shifted over the last 12 months and think about are there other ways that you can be making a smoother transaction for people? I guarantee you, if you're putting road humps, speed bumps in the way to purchase, excuse me, your clients are going to find an alternate solution. So it's be, it's thinking this stuff through now around, you know, are they going from Facebook to our website? Are they going from Google My Business to calling me? Are they, what are they doing? What are those steps? And just smoothing out those edges. So if I go from Facebook to Instagram to your website, I can tell the branding colors are the same. The experience is the same. I can see those images reflected, the type of images that you use, all of that stuff around the brand. So I'm not kind of going, is that really, is that Alice's stuff? Because it doesn't quite look like it did on LinkedIn or boy, the website looks really different or the language is different. So just smooth out those edges. You don't want any of those little subliminal things kind of creating roadblocks to people spending money with you. And this all fits into your SEO strategy, right? Because if you can even those pathways out, Google recognizes that, hey, the branding, the language, that everything is the same on Facebook, on Google My Business, on YouTube, on the website. You've got content out all over the place that looks and feels the same. It helps develop credibility and authority in Google's eyes. So social shopping now is a real thing. So getting your images, getting your phrases, getting your ability to purchase, looking the same across all of the portals. We just kind of talked about that, right? It's a really important consideration. People will jump from platform to platform and you want them, you know, maybe they're searching on a hashtag. So you want to make sure that your stuff is coming up, looking, smelling, feeling, um, hearing, sounding like the same across all the platforms. So I'm beginning to see and recognize, oh, that's absolutely got to be a mark thing. It's got to be because I just see his stuff everywhere. It looks the same. The logo is always in the same position. The way that he writes is the same. So we're, we're smoothing out those edges and we're just making it a frictionless experience for our clients to spend money with us. Thinking about AI, it's already impacting the way that we target and engage clients, and it's only going to become more and more imperative to get this right. So think about, you know, things like your pixels, right? Most of us have a Facebook pixel sitting on our website so we can begin to retarget, retract clients. We're dealing in chatbots now. All of this plays into your overarching SEO strategy. So we're needing to be checking in on this stuff more frequently. You know, once upon a time, you'd set your pixel up, your web designer might set it up for you when you had your website built. Maybe that was three years ago. And now you're kind of going, oh, I don't even know if it's there. I don't know what pages it's connected to. You know, I've never done a retargeting campaign. I have no idea if my colors are the same across my social platforms. This all is now beginning to play into our SEO strategy. And this is the stuff that's going to set our business apart from our comp uh, com competitors. There we go, competition. So thinking about getting this seamless, frictionless experience that if I go to uh, Nanette's Facebook page and then jump across to Instagram and I'm searching for something, Nanette stuff comes up and I can go, oh, that's Nanette's, I can tell. It all looks the same. It looks beautiful. I'm going to jump across to her website now. Okay, that all looks, smells, feels, sounds the same as what I'm experiencing. I'm on YouTube. I'm seeing Nanette again, I'm, you know, listening to a podcast and there's Nanette again. So it's just creating that extra bit of credibility without having to do any of the legwork really in the client's mind. AR is another thing that's going to really begin to impact our SEO strategy. We're beginning to see it really, really roll out 
across shopping centers in the US and the UK. Um, and it will hit Australia. It will. We're, we're beginning to see the, the um, slight effects of it, but this is going to hit like Facebook and social media hit small businesses, you know, 10 years ago. AR, AI is going to be the next big thing that we're really going to have to get our heads across and really understand how this fits into the whole uh, online environment stuff that we're creating. All right, so we've got speed, we've got mobile responsiveness, we've talked security, we've touched on SEO. The next one to look at is our content. Now, content is still king. If you take nothing else away from today's webinar, by creating content on a regular basis you're already ahead of the majority of your competitors people still aren't doing it and content is absolutely king so according to the content marketing institute and if you're ever looking for anyone to follow around um, you know the ideas behind content marketing content marketing institute is the place to start Around 70% of all B2B marketers now believe that their content efforts are more successful now than in previous years. Why is that? Think back to my story about the caravan. So what happened? I found a couple of models, a couple of makes that I think are going to be right. I'm popping that into Google. I'm jumping then to YouTube and I'm watching videos. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm reading blogs. I'm getting eBooks. I'm looking at infographics. That's all content around my SEO words that I'm interested in, right? So it's thinking about how all this starts to fit together. So more content on your website, and I'm sure your website um, person has always said to you, create blogs, regular content is what Google's looking for. Basically what it means is more content on your website means more pages that Google can read, more indexed pages. What does that mean? It means you appear on more search engine result pages. So if you ever see the word SERPs appear, that's what that means, that you've written a blog about something that I've got a problem on that can be indexed and can be seen by people online. So the more content you're putting out, the more chances you've got that I'm going to see what it is that you're putting out there. Google prioritizes new content. So if you wrote a blog that's 12 months old, tart it up, polish it off, pull it back up, change a few words around, make sure that it's relevant for 2021, re-release it, Google will see it as new content. So Google will absolutely prioritize new stuff over old stuff. Sharing your knowledge builds your brand reputation. So I can tell you I've seen the same handful of people, three to four companies, show up in everything that I've looked at now about these caravanning kind of stuff. So guaranteed, I'm going to be reaching out to those couple of people and having conversations when I'm ready to actually hand over my, you know, my hard earned cash. I've already got in my mind now those three companies that I want to have a chat to, three to four companies. Why? Because I see them on YouTube, because I see them on blogs, because I've downloaded an ebook, because I've seen infographics, I've seen them on LinkedIn, they're popping up on Facebook. So just being out there talking about what it is that you do that you're good at, your zone of genius, build your brand reputation. It helps build an engaged and loyal audience. So once I've become a customer of yours, you want to keep me engaged. You want to keep me coming back to make sure that I'm interacting with that brand. What better way than to make sure that you've got regular content coming out that's aimed at me. So once I've bought my caravan, then I'm going to want to know about where are the best places to stay? What are the things I need to be aware of when I'm out on the road? Are there any tools that I need to have that I mightn't have thought through yet? What do I do with the puppies when I'm, you know, in a location? So you've got this whole kind of journey that you can take people through from not just pre-purchase to purchase, but what happens after I become a client of yours? How are you going to keep me engaged? How are you going to keep me coming back to your site? So in another couple of years time, when I go, you know what, I really like this caravanning thing. I want to upgrade now. I'm going to come back to you as opposed to look around and start all over again. I'm going to know I'm just going to go back to Mark because Mark took care of me from the get go. And I've been hearing and reading articles from him and checking him out on YouTube. And I'm still actively engaged in his network. Why would I want to go anywhere else? Um, so and the last thing is content now is not just blogs. You know, so 
I have a lot of clients who just go, look, I'm not a writer. I don't want to write. So that's okay. That's okay. Create video, create audio, create infographics. You'll have something that you enjoy doing. Do that. You know, if you're a video person, do video, send it to someone to get a transcript created, throw the transcript on the website. That's still new content for Google. Look at the video and then go, oh, I can pull that bit out and that becomes a social media tile. So it's not about creating new content every other day. It's about being smart with the new content that you create. So if it is one new blog, if you are a writer, thinking about, can you turn that blog into a video? Can you read it down the camera? And that becomes a video that you upload to YouTube. Can you pull the audio out of that video then and release it as a podcast or some audio that you can have as snippets that can go in emails to answer people's questions? You know, can you turn that blog into an infographic? Can you turn it into some social media tiles? Typically, if I work with a client and we do a blog or a podcast episode or a video, we'll get seven to 10 other bits of content out of that one blog. So don't feel like, oh my God, now Tracy's telling me I've got to spend five hours a week writing a new blog and doing all this stuff. No, give yourself an hour maybe or two hours if you, you know, you want to spend a lot of time on this stuff and build up a bank of things. But, you know, a couple of hours every month and you're going to have enough content to be putting in these different places. So you're creating that environment that looks, smells, sounds, you know, the same across every platform just by investing the time to do it in one location first. So content still king, you still need to be doing it. All right, the next one is Google My Business. Now, this is a really, really important, probably one of the most important social media platforms now, and people still aren't using it. Now, Google My Business owned by Google. So you need to be there. Whether you're a location-based business or a service-based business, there is absolute gold in Google My Business and every small business owner needs to have a GMB page. If you don't and you don't know where to start, let's have a one-hour ASPAS call, but you need a GMB page. That's bottom line. 46% of all Google searches are looking for local information. So I know um, Andrea's got a location. Um, I'm assuming, I'm trying to remember Mark's business, um, but I'm not sure. I'm I'm assuming some of you have location-based businesses and some of you are probably service-based like I am. You still need to have a Google My Business page. Four in five consumers use a search engine to find out local information. Mark does. Thank you, Mark. Um, So you absolutely need to be able to tell people, here's where I am. Here's when I'm open. Here's how you find me. Um, If you don't have a Google My Business page, you will not appear in Google Maps. If you're not appearing in Google, Google Maps, people aren't finding you when they're out and about. You need to increase your overall visibility and it gives you some really good stats. You know, you can look in the insights and see how many people found you because they searched on Google for something related to your industry, for your brand directly, for your name, or whether they found you via Google Maps. There's a lot of really good information in there that you can use along with your Google Analytics, along with your Facebook Analytics to help strengthen this online environment. So Mark's just said with GMB, how do you load that your business assists clients Australia-wide? So that's a great question, Mark. In the back end, in the info section under service locations, just list Australia. Um, You have 20 locations that you can list. So typically I say to people, go micro or macro. So go, you know, um, Rabina, for example, if you're on the Gold Coast, if that's, you know, a big area for you, but then have Gold Coast um, and then go Queensland. Brisbane and then go Australia wide. Um, if you want more info on that, we can definitely do a one to one and talk about that. Um, so, so basically, what I'm saying is GMB, Google My Business, is it's free. It's not something you need to spend a lot of time in. You can put one post up a week, posts stay live for seven days and then they disappear. So, you don't need to put a lot of time or effort into it. It will help with your SEO. So your keywords and your phrases and your questions and the things you put in the content of your Google My Business um, will absolutely build out 
to assist in this overall platform that we're trying to rise, its overall environment, right? So it absolutely assists with the SEO and absolutely assists with the good quality data and insights that you can be pulling off the back of the page. All right. Um, the last one is social media. Now, when we're talking about creating our online environment, social media is still a big part of it. I don't want you to freak out though, because I have a lot of people that kind of say, I just can't do everything. I can't be everywhere, nor should you be. I say be where your people are. So this will come down to you knowing your people and nobody knows your clients better than you. Nobody knows what you do better than you. Typically in Australia, I say you need a Facebook page. Facebook is still the most popular social media platform in Australia, bar none, depending on the age group. If you're working with people that are kind of, you know, 25 plus, 30 plus, they're going to have a Facebook page or they're going to have a Facebook profile. So you definitely need to be on Facebook. Then if you're in a B2B environment, probably LinkedIn would be the next one. Um, if you're working with a female crowd or a younger crowd, so kind of, you know, 18 to 30 or their mums or fitness or health or um, hospitality, you're going to want to have an Instagram page. Maybe you want to have Pinterest, but start with one or two, get them solid, get them right, get your strategy right, get into a regular um, flow of when and how often you're communicating on those pages and then expand. Don't try and take on everything at once. Don't suddenly go, oh my God, I need to be on TikTok and Snapchat and Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram and Twitter. And you'll, you'll completely fall in a heap. You won't post to any of them and you'll just get burnt out. So start small, get it right. So if you've got a Facebook page, just get your regularity right. You know, the biggest thing I see is, is that people go, oh, I've got a Facebook page, but, you know, oh, I haven't posted to it for a few weeks. And then they get all excited and they post five days in a row and then they don't post again for three weeks. So use, use the tools that are on offer to you. So if we're talking Facebook and Instagram, you know, they've got a great scheduling tool in the back end there. Use the tools that, you know, maybe on a Monday morning, you set aside an hour and you just go, right, I'm going to schedule content across my two platforms for the coming week so I don't have to think about it so you sit in the back end you write your posts for the week you upload your photos you do all of that stuff you're done you don't have to think oh my god it's Tuesday I haven't posted anything I need to hurry up and come up with an idea just put aside some time and yes it takes time none of this stuff is going to be a quick fix but typically, you know, an hour on a Monday morning, two hours on a Monday morning, you can sit down, you can schedule your content, you can think about what do you want to write in terms of a blog? Do you want to create a video? Because you only need to do that like once a month and then repurpose the content. You can have a look, you know, in that window on a monthly basis at your insights. How am I tracking on Google Analytics? What's happening in Google My Business? How's my Facebook looking? What posts are resonating? What's working so I can do more of that? You know, having a look at the calendar, thinking about what's coming up, starting to get some ideas flowing. Is that worth a blog? Do I need to be creating an infographic or an ebook around that? But it's starting to get a little bit more um, concentrated and um, putting a concerted effort into what you do, getting that strategy right, getting that piece in place that allows you to post to the platforms that are where your people are hanging out and starting to think through, okay, is my branding the same? You know, am I using the same colors? Am I using the same kind of fonts? Is my language the same? Are my images kind of the same? Um, you'll notice if you have a look at my website or my socials or the slide deck, I have a certain feel, right? All of my background images are the same. My fonts are the same. I have, um, you know, that 50s to 70s kind of vibe going on with my images. Um, so you'll see that when you look across my brand, wherever I'm at, you kind of know my stuff pretty quickly because it has that same look, feel, smell, taste, whatever to it. So it's about starting to get that consistency across your brand and across what you're doing. Okay, so let's 
pull it all together and let's see what this looks like. And at this point, if you've got any questions on any of them, start popping them into the chat. We've got about 15 minutes to go. So I want to make sure that we're covering off anything specific that you want to talk about as it relates to your business, your industry, that kind of thing. All right. So we started talking about speed. So again, thinking about this in the context of an online environment, what's the speed of my site like? And what's it like on a laptop or desktop, which according to Google is the same thing, they don't split that out, versus a tablet versus a mobile phone. Making sure that it's not taking longer than about three seconds for your site to load up. If it is, we're going in and we're checking, you know, are my images too big? Uh, have I loaded video directly to the site instead of embed it from YouTube? You know, just making sure that that stuff is accurate, is good, is, you know, as solid as it can be. And we talked about using a platform like GT Metrics, which is a free platform where you can pop your URL in and it will go through and do a speed analysis for you. We then talked about mobile responsiveness, the importance that Google and people place on having a mobile first site. So understanding that people are doing the majority of their searches globally now via mobile phones, whether it's looking at websites, whether it's social media scrolling, purchasing online, whatever that is, making sure that our site, all of our kind of environment, again, is mobile first responsive. So it's looking pretty on the mobile. It's making sense. It's starting to get that brand continuity going across the platforms for you. We then talked about security. Um, now, as I said, in Australia, this probably isn't a huge issue yet for most of the consumers, but the ones that are aware of it are very aware of it. So starting to think through what's our policy for handling people's information, for storing that information, who do we release it to, um, how are we going to communicate with our clients if we've had a breach, how are we communicating with our people, you know, how we are using their information, how we are using their data, even down to thinking about, you know, what's the, what's the storage solution for your CRM, you know, what information are you gathering on your people, where are you storing it and how are you using it, just starting to become really aware of what that looks like. We then started to talk about SEO and how SEO relates to the whole of the environment. So again, not just thinking through the website, but what does our SEO look like in terms of uh, what content we're putting out on YouTube? Are we starting to think about voice searching? Are we starting to think about, you know, um, the, uh, the little grabs and again, forgive me, cold brain here, cotton wool. Um, but you know, when you search now, you've got the little grabs that just appear at the top of the thing. <coughs> are you indexing your content for those? Are you starting to index your content for voice searching? Are you making sure that your keywords, your phrases, the things that you know that people are searching for are across all of your platforms or across all of your environments. So not just your website, but you're using them in social media posts. They're in your LinkedIn profile when you've created that. So you've spent some time making sure that your keywords and phrases are embedded into all of your content, that you've got it into Google My Business, that if you're uploading a YouTube video, that you're using your keywords and phrases. If you're putting out a podcast, if you're on Clubhouse, all of that kind of stuff, making sure now that our SEO is reaching across all of the platforms and that we're leaning on our analytics from Google Analytics for our website, Google My Business Insight, Facebook Insights. We're using things like Answer the Public or um, Google People Often Ask, you know, those kinds of things to be creating content that's going to help our SEO and drive our overarching online environment. So then we talked about content and making sure that what we're putting out is, you know, not only what people are searching for, but understanding that Google loves new content. So we're, we're potentially rehashing, re, 
um, booting old stuff that we've got on our website. We're giving the website maybe a bit of a, a spit and polish that we're putting content where our people are. So are we putting video on YouTube? Have we got a podcast? Have we got audio grabs? Are we doing infographics? Are we um, posting on LinkedIn? Are we, you know, what are we doing? And how is it all fitting into the rest of these things? How's that content looking on our phone? When we've uploaded a new blog, has it affected the speed of our website? Have we checked that the images have all got alt tags on them? So we've renamed the images in our blogs so they help with our SEO. So you can see all these pieces are now starting to build a rich tapestry that's creating this online environment. So spending some time and getting a bit of a content strategy together. So we know, okay, I don't like blogging, but I don't mind creating videos. So I'm going to create a video once a month, but out of that, I'm going to get someone to write a blog for me or put a transcription up and that's going to be SEO rich. And we're going to make sure that that's sitting okay on our mobile and it's not affecting our speed. If we're asking people to, you know, provide some details to download an ebook, what are we doing with those details? How does that look for our security? So it's all starting to piece together. We talked about Google My Business and the importance of that as a standalone element of our environment and how that fits into the SEO component, how it uh, links into the mobile responsiveness that people are using it to look for local searches, to find people not just by the business name, but by the industry, by the brand, by something similar that will give us a bit of a heads up to, okay, there's some content I need to write there around an SEO phrase because I know the people are searching for that. The insights that we can get from Google My Business that then start to feed back into our content, our SEO, making sure it looks pretty on the site, making sure that it's still nice and quick. Are we asking for people's information? And the final one we talked about was our socials. What platforms do we need to be on? Is everything looking uniform? Do we have a color palette? Do we have fonts that we need to be using? Do we always put our logo in the bottom right-hand corner? What kind of language do we use? So we know when our clients are jumping from platform to platform, they're going to start to recognize our brand and they're going to start to piece together from the pre-purchase right through to continuing to stay engaged with our community, perhaps refer new business to us, build up this cheer squad for our businesses, which we all need now more than ever. So that's the top seven steps to creating our online environment and why our website is not enough anymore. So we've got a few minutes left. Pop any questions that you've got into the chat box. A couple of last things that I want to make sure that I touch on for you. So for anyone based in Queensland, which I think most of you are, um, just a heads up that the Department of Small Business have released the latest grant of the Queensland Business Basics Grant. It opens on May 31, but the information about it is out today, well, last night. So basically it's 5K, so XGST, $5,000 that you can use to develop your business around training, coaching, getting a website built or upgrade, professional business advice, strategic marketing services, business continuity and succession planning. So if any of this stuff that we talked about today, you know, creating a content strategy, developing this online environment, if any of those kind of went, yeah, I get it. I need to do it. Where do I start? Maybe looking at applying for the grant, um, hit me up. We can have a conversation around what that looks like. The nice thing about this five grand is it is not, co-contributed so it's a full five grand from the government you don't need to put in anything to be eligible you need to have fewer than 20 employees a current abn uh, queensland headquarters registered for gst and your turnover needs to be less than three hundred thousand for the current financial year now the applications open on may 31 there's a few things you need to do to tick the box to have it ready you've got to have a stat deck um, you know, or your um, quotes and things together. Um, 
the interesting thing is the applications will close when there's enough submissions received. So it is a competitive grant. It's not just you've ticked the box, we're going to give you the cash. Um, so the applications I suspect will close fairly quickly, a bit like the adaptation grant. I reckon the um, exhaustion will happen around that kind of probably first few days, to be honest. Um, so get a move on if that's something that interests you. Get all your ducks in a row now. So May 31, you're ready to submit your grant application. So just drop me a message. I'll give you my details in a second if you want to chat through how we can help or what that could look like for your business. Um, the other thing you need to know is that my book, The End of Technophobia, is being launched at the Click Digital event in Brisbane. So if you're around the Brisbane area on uh, Thursday, May 27th at the Brisbane Convention Centre, it's an all-day thing. If you're interested in going, I have a free code that I can give you so you don't have to pay. Um, the launch is at 8.30 in the morning till 9 and then there's 30 odd workshops throughout the day that you can choose to attend um, panel discussions, trade tables, and David Kosh from sunrise will be in, in the afternoon to deliver a keynote. So that's bound to be an amazing day. Love to see some friendly faces there. And my book launch, as I said, as part of that, I'm also in Ipswich this Friday, they having their click digital event. That's an all day thing. I'll be delivering two workshops in Ipswich, one on cybersecurity in the morning. So if that conversation around security is something that interests you, we'll be talking about developing your cybersecurity policy and I'll be talking podcasting in the afternoon. So if you'd like info on that, let me know and happy to provide that for you. If we haven't had a one-on-one -on -one Aspas consult yet, you can just uh, scan the QR code. That'll take you to a link to book a day and a time with me that suits you. If you've not had a one-to-one -one Aspas consult yet, your first consult is free. After that, it's $44 and then $66. At this stage, the Aspas program is due to wind up at the end of June. So you can do two sessions in May, two sessions in June um, and make sure that you get those booked in before the end of June. There's talk that it may be extended, but that's not confirmed. So don't rely on that happening. Book in a consult if you want to talk about any of the stuff that we've gone through today or if there's anything in particular that is of interest to you, cybersecurity, podcasting, marketing strategy, content development, any of that kind of stuff. Um, last but not least, there's all my details. So that's my website, my email, info at the digital guide.com.au. Probably the easiest one is follow me on Facebook. So Tracy, the, the digital guide um, or LinkedIn. Uh, drop me a message. Love to have a chat to a few of you about this business basic grant. Um, that 5K is there. I just love people to use it and get some advice and get some strategic plans happening for their business, whether it's coaching, whether it's training, um, you know, any of that kind of stuff, SEO policies, um, cybersecurity policies, creating, you know, spending some, some time and effort creating this online environment for your clients. Um, we can certainly use the funding to get that right for your business. So that's kind of it for me. I love it when we wind up, you know, we're actually a little early not as many questions what as what I was expecting to be honest so I'm going to hang around here for a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions please do pop them into the chat box Andrea you're most welcome thank you for taking an hour out of your day um, if you don't have any questions feel free to sign off thank you so much as I said for spending an hour um, but I will hang around for the full to for you know till 2 p.m in case anyone does have anything that they want to ask um but hit me up if you've got any questions that's the main thing hope to see a few of you in ipswich on friday or in brisbane on the 27th love to see you at the book launch um, and spend some time and think through that online environment for your business and see how you can put that strategy in place to get that kind of cranking and making sure that your clients understand and start to create that frictionless environment from pre-purchase all the way through to becoming 
a loyal referring cheer squad for your client. So that's it from me. Have a fabulous afternoon. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name's Tracy Sheen. I'm known as the Digital Guide. Big thanks to Aspas, to RDA Brisbane and to Business Station in WA for facilitating the workshop. And most importantly, thank you to everybody who is watching the replay and has tuned in live. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'll see you on another webinar or another workshop. For now, take care.